Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes? Great. Um, I'm Kristen Boddy. I'm the Membership and Events Manager here at the Asheville Art Museum, and I am so excited to welcome Potter Matt Jones, uh, who's here today to lead today's program. I'm sure many of you are familiar with his Star Wars trilogy pots, which are on display in our atrium. Um, they're impressive not only for their symbolism and the drawings, but of course for their incredible size. Um, they're a favorite among visitors, and I also really love them. I think I see something new every time I look at them. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Matt speak about these pots and his other work today. Uh, before I turn this over to Matt, um, I think we are waiting for some other folks to join, but um, I do just want to go over some housekeeping for all our attendees. First, please note that all your microphones are muted by default. We are recording today's program, so if you prefer not to be recorded, please make sure that your video remains off. Both the microphone and video camera symbols at the bottom of your screen will have red lines through them to indicate that they're off. We will share a recording of this program on our YouTube channel by tomorrow and in our next e-newsletter. And finally, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please type it into the chat box. I encourage you to answer or ask your questions as we go. I'll read them to Matt at appropriate stopping points. And I will send out an evaluation after this program it concludes. The information you provide through these evaluations is really important for us when we're applying for grants or reporting on programs. So please do take just a few minutes of your time to fill those out. Um, and finally, I want to thank all of you again for your support as members of the museum. 2020 is finally over, uh, but the COVID crisis isn't and we still need your support. Please encourage your friends and family to become members, to visit the museum, um, and donate if they can. Uh, we rely on all of you to be able to continue serving the Western North Carolina community. Um, and as another reminder, our Across the Atlantic exhibition opens next week. We are having a special member preview on Thursday evening, so if you plan to attend, I encourage you to RSVP while you can. Uh, the uh, preview is free, and so I hope I'll see you all there. And now, Matt, I will stop sharing my screen so you can share yours and we can get started on this program. And don't forget to unmute yourself too. Can you hear me? I can. All right. Um, let's see here. How do I get out of I'd like to be able to see my screen rather than all of these wonderful faces here. Let's see here. So once you pull up your slides, that should take over. Oh, I just I just pressed that button. Yeah. Are you still there? I am. Can you hear me? I can. Um, well, uh, this seems a little strange. Can I see you somewhere? You can see my um, slides there. We don't see them yet. Have you shared them? Okay, I seem to have. Share screen. In the meantime, everyone enjoy Sandy's shepherd's cat on screen. There we go. That share? We can see it now. So if you just go into presenter mode, you're good to go. Okay, that works. Okay. Is every, you can see that now? Yes. All right. Well, I'm sorry about my um, technical naivete with these Zoom situations. This is a bit of a step out for me. I'm not, uh, I've not done this before. So bear with me a little bit as I get the hang of this and um, I'll do the best I can. Um, I'd like to, of course, thank Kristen for reaching out to me and asking me to do this program. And I'll be interested to uh, listen to some of your questions and try and answer them as we go through. And also, I would just like to thank the Asheville Art Museum generally, and, and maybe Pam Meyer specifically for taking an interest in, in my work and, and uh, displaying it in, in the 
new lobby and just how impressed I am with the entire new museum. And of course, a little frustrated that we've had this, uh, this virus to deal with and it's put everything off track, but I'm looking forward to everything getting normalized again and et cetera, et cetera. So um, today I thought I would talk to you about uh, narrative in several dimensions. Um, you know, my work in my work, of course, um, but also just the narratives that we're all exposed to and how those help to sort of guide us and shape our lives and how we are challenged by narratives and push back and challenge the narratives that we all encounter um, and how that has been uh, a source of inspiration for me as I work as a potter. And I'm also um, going to give you another narrative, which is just kind of my backstory to give you a little bit of a history of, of sort of where I'm coming from and how I came to be a potter um, working in North Carolina. I've been living here in Western North Carolina and Sandy Mush specifically um, for the past 23 years. Um, I've, I've with my wife and two children, my children are both in college and I've been making, I've been working as a full-time potter for, for all of that time. And um, let me see here. And uh, I suppose it's a, it's, it's a little bit interesting to, to be a potter. I, I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, my parents were both uh, from the upstate of South Carolina. And um, there's an interesting tension between the upstate of South Carolina and Charleston. I think Charleston views itself as the sort of the cultural center, center of South Carolina, if not the entire world. And um, there's a, a kind of a, an elite little peninsular community that I actually became a part of. My, um, my father passed away when I was four years old. Um, we were living in Wilmington, North Carolina, and about five years later, my mother remarried to a physician in Charleston, an anesthesiologist in Charleston. And I moved to Charleston with my family and um, was part of, of this um, peninsular community in the historic district, downtown Charleston. And uh, it's a very, uh, in some ways, uh, you know, it's an it's a extremely beautiful setting grow up in. And I think I was completely oblivious to how much that um, meant to me as a child and, and didn't really, it, it just didn't really even register until I went to other places and saw that not everywhere was, was nearly as beautiful as that setting. Um, it was a setting of uh, a slightly intimidating setting in some ways. Um, there was a lot of sort of ostentatious displays of wealth pretty much everywhere you look. And um, I felt keenly aware of my status as kind of an outsider, having moved in in the fourth or fifth grade, whereas most of the kids that I was hanging out with, their great, 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 great grandparents had been born in Charleston. And um, it's, a, it's kind of a, an interesting community in that way that values uh, long, long history. Um, so, uh, and, 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 it, and it's most of my stepfather's friends and my mother's friends were very professional class, very, uh, very white collar, very, um, well, they were all doctors and lawyers basically and, and extremely successful business people. And, um, that never, that whole white collar thing just never really I, I always felt a tension, I suppose, as a child of like eventually thinking I would need to conform and find some career that would work for me, but never really having any interest in any of the things that I was seeing on a day-to-day -day basis um, through my family. And um, some of the narratives um, that sort of shaped who I am and I think who all of us are um, I don't really, I haven't been able to find my notes here, but I'll just try to remember. Um, 
we we rely on political narratives. We rely on religious narratives, historical narratives, um, perhaps career narratives, uh, financial or economic narratives, all of these things to guide ourselves through the world that we live in. And as an adolescent, I, um, I wasn't really drawn to many things. I think growing up in a church environment actually influenced me towards, um, towards uh, sort of a literary disposition, which I explored more in high school and college, um, studying a lot of literature. Um, but as a child growing up, reading and, and hearing biblical stories and trying to analyze them in Sunday school and listening to somebody preach each, each Sunday was um, in some ways um, a kind of an influential thing for me because I actually had an ear for it. I would actually listen to what they were saying and think about it. And uh, so in high school and later in college, um, I realized that, that I always gravitated towards literature and I, I liked to read, I liked to get lost in stories. And um, when I wasn't doing that, I liked being outdoors. I, as a child, I, I loved going fishing and surfing and skateboarding. I just loved just doing anything outside. And um, so I didn't really know, of course, where my life was leading me. I didn't feel like it was leading me anywhere, to be quite honest. And college was kind of a foregone conclusion in my family. So I ended up in college uh, still sort of not really knowing. I think my parents were pretty hands off in terms of, of career guidance or guidance of any kind. I was kind of a middle, classic middle child in that way, I suppose. Um, but I always, as I say, I always liked um, literature and sort of figured that that would be the direction I would go with my studies, not really seeing how that would ever manifest in any career um, career shape. And um, that, that made me a little bit nervous. Um, additionally, I hated writing papers. They, they stressed me out and um, I, I did really well with reading and participating in class and uh, tests. All of that was very easy for me, but I didn't like writing papers. That, somehow had uh, some kind of mental block, I suppose, to that. And, and meanwhile, I discovered that I was a much happier person when I had an art class in, in whatever semester I was arranging. And so I studied some, I, I took some painting and some art fundamentals classes and some art history. And I just, I didn't think I was any good at it, but I just liked having that as a creative outlet, something that would take my mind off of the deadline pressures of papers and all the other stuff that goes along with college. And uh, as it happened, um, one semester, the only art class that would fit in to my, um, to my semester was a ceramics class. And I had not had a really great relationship with the other art professors. And I heard that this professor was quite good. And so I signed up for that class. And, um, and I remember just getting into the studio and, and being, being just immediately enthralled with everything about um, the way the class was being taught and the tactile experience of interacting with clay. And we mixed our own clay from right, right from the beginning. We made our own glazes. We were really immersed right from the beginning. And um, I really, I really just, I had never felt so enthralled. I'd never felt like I had found something that was really, really speaking to me before. And um, this was, uh, it was almost like some kind of strange spiritual revelation was happening. My mind was expanding and opening up and I felt as if that I was learning something important and that I needed to pay close attention. And long story short, within a week, I, I think I had declared an art major and ceramics was going to be my focus. And um, I, I really didn't look back, even though 
for most of the time I was in college, I had no clue of where it was going to lead me. No idea really that, um, that pottery was a viable uh, profession. And again, I think back to my childhood and, and never ever interacting with any artists of, of any kind and never really seeing that that was, you know, I always liked painting and drawing and stuff when I was a kid, but I never really thought of it as something that was doable. And so um, as I think of art and art history and those narratives, I think of kind of a long study of, of incredible geniuses who were able to put their art in front of the world. And I really don't think we focus, or I certainly didn't focus on the fact that there are lots of artists living and functioning in the world who aren't mega geniuses. They aren't the Picassos and the Matisses and the this and that person, Michelangelo's. Um, and even though I just have enormous respect and love for that, all of that, I, I never, ever, ever thought that that would be a track that was legitimate for a kind of a mediocre person like myself to go down. Um, and then, so, so the next narrative that opens up is this craft narrative, this pottery narrative of like, oh, actually you can possibly just make a living by doing something creative that doesn't have to be um, in any way groundbreaking or ingenious. It's just um, something that allows you to explore your creative freedom and um, sell, sell the pottery to people and thereby make a living. And this was a tremendously uh, empowering narrative. And I, um, I remember I met a potter, I began to meet potters. I think I met, the first potter I met uh, outside of my professor was uh, a fellow in Madison, Wisconsin, where my girl, then girlfriend, now wife, was uh, studying. And um, I became, I, I would go and visit him every time I would visit her. And we had, my wife and I were carrying on kind of a long distance relationship. And this potter was a wood firing potter. And um, I really, I, and I just peppered him with questions and wanted to understand how it was he had gotten to where he was and how his pottery had so much strength and, in, you know, integrity from my point of view. And um, so basically one thing led to another and um, I realized, you know, I understood that he had done apprenticeships and I, that was a new concept to me altogether. And yet it made perfect sense that you would go and, and immerse yourself with a master to learn and become proficient at the craft. And so um, I asked him if he would take me as an apprentice and um, he was, he already had one, but he put me in touch with um, Mark Hewitt in, in Pist Pittsburgh, North Carolina and Todd Piker in Cornwall Bridge, Connecticut. And I worked for both of them. I worked, I went to, uh, I went to Connecticut and worked with Todd Piker. Um, Todd, I just put a new image up here. Todd is on my right. This is actually a visit from maybe two years ago. I just kind of dropped in on him casually as we were driving to um, visit my wife's family in Maine. And Todd uh, had a large wood burning kiln that he built in 1972 and had conducted a business there. And I think I worked for him 1994 to 97. And on my left, on the left of the screen is David Bean, who was Todd's uh, uh, decorator. And these were my two mentors for the next two and a half to, or maybe three years. And, you know, um, I can't say enough about immersing yourself if you want to become proficient at something, just to immerse yourself in the life and the rhythms of professional business where there is a creative goal going on. Um, basically all of the skill I have, none of it comes from, from college or art school or any of that. That, 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 was, that was merely a time to familiarize myself with and get excited about the material. 
but in terms of um, becoming a productive potter, someone who could make a living, um, the apprenticeship was, was really the key for me. And it was extremely hard work and you've come face to face with the fact that you have romanticized in your own mind. And I think I, I see this still as a potter today, people frequently come into my workshop and they just say, oh, this must be so great. You're just out here doing what you love. And, and it's true, it's true, but it's also not just, there's, there's, a, there's a, narratives have counter narratives <laughs> and sometimes reality and narrative are in conflict with one another. Um, there's a lot of very, very hard work that goes into becoming a potter and then staying a potter. It's, uh, it's just a lot of physically difficult, demanding work. The hours are long. Um, the pay is not necessarily good, particularly not as an apprentice, um, but you can do it and you have to stick to it. And it's, uh, you know, I think, I think people who put themselves through some tough discipline and are able to, or, or I certainly have met people who are just extremely naturally talented and those people always blow me away. I was not someone who was naturally talented. I had to work very, very hard to get my skills um, to a level where I felt comfortable going out on my own. And these are two of the people who helped me do that. Um, This is some of my brushwork. Um, like I said on the slide beforehand, David Bean was a decorator for Todd and I would sit and watch Dave paint. And we had only maybe three, four or five patterns that we would do. And it was really, um, artistically it was, it was somewhat, um, how do I put it without being insulting? Uh, it was somewhat limited. And it was uh, the, the, the town where Todd lived was, had tourist traffic. A lot of New Yorkers would come to Connecticut at leaf peeping season, similar to, <laughs> we have a little of that here, I suppose. And we would just crank out mugs and bowls and plates. And it was just like slap a dragonfly or a, a fish or a bird on there and that was it. It was just like, there was not a pottery understand, there was not a culture of pottery understanding in that area at that time. And so it was really kind of a tourist driven business. And, but even, even with that limitation, I saw uh, something in Dave's work and something in Todd's work ethic that um, was very inspiring and even though the patterns were limited, the, the quality of the brush strokes were so good. And um, I continued uh, when I wasn't making pots to read about pottery, read pottery biography, read, um, read pottery history, look at books constantly. Um, I was specifically interested in um, Chinese painting, Chinese uh, brush painting. And Chinese brush painting is probably the most significant influence on Western pottery tradition in, in, in my personal view. Um, in, I don't know, the 14th or 15th century, uh, Chinese porcelain began to hit the markets of Europe and were collected by aristocrats throughout Europe and extremely popular, extremely valuable, extremely expensive and limited. And what happened in Europe was that um, there, technologically Europe was way behind the Orient. And um, so Europe, European producers began to mimic uh, Chinese porcelain by using earthenware, putting a white tin gl glaze on and then painting that with cobalt. And there are many production centers. Delft, I think, might be the most popular one that people know of, where blue and white painting became the norm. Italian maiolica, all of, all of these things are, are basically tin glazed. And then um, a palette of, of colors, frequently a blue and white was, was a frequently 
very popular color and it was in order to provide a cheaper product that had the look and sophistication of this Eastern uh, porcelain. So roughly, I feel like, um, you know, Europeans have been imitating that model for, what, 500 years. And it, it's, it's basically become a part of our own um, narrative with, with pottery, our own narrative within our, our own aesthetic narrative, I suppose. Matt, and, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, um, no. we do have a question that came in specifically about these pieces asking if this collection has a name and if the pieces that have your brush strokes on it are signed. Yes, uh, I, they, they don't really have a name. Um, these are, I, I'm going to show a bunch of examples here. Um, I'm just doing a lot of setup here, but uh, these, you know, these are just production items. Um, on the left side of the screen, that's just a dinner plate with some dragonflies on there. Um, I, I, I did a lot that, that sort of ch changed and elevated the game from, from what I had learned as an apprentice to create a little more context and a little, I don't know, there, there was something I just found a little bit lacking in, in what I learned as an apprentice and I wanted to flesh it out. I've always been a little bit more of an over decorator than an under decorator. And I think there's a beautiful sort of organic complexity, uh, sort of a almost intuitive geometry to some of these patterns that I, I can't really put into terribly good words, but um, these are production items. So on, on the right is just a serving bowl. It may have been maybe a salad bowl size or slightly larger. Um, let me go ahead and see what else we have here. Okay, so. So the blue and white was really kind of the first thing. These are all fired in a wood burning kiln. You can see this, um, these rims have the beautiful wood fired markings. The, the, and then these uh, white spots that surround the perimeter are from the pots actually being stacked rim to rim in the kiln. And they have little pieces of kiln wadding that separate them and keep them from fusing. And that preserves the color that the clay would be if not for the um, exposure to the wood smoke. So the, the actual look of the pottery becomes kind of a part of the story of its history within the kiln. So again, on the left, I've got brushwork here. And I, you know, I also have, I just have loads and loads of interest. In, and to the right, you can see I'm, um, sort of tapping into a, another interest, which was uh, like an African textile motif. Um, I had taken an African art history class in Wisconsin um, when I stayed a semester in Wisconsin. They actually have a very good African art history program up there. And um, I became very interested in their textiles and um, Diamonds, in particular, seem to dominate a lot of their, their textiles, mud cloth. Uh, what's the other one called? The raffia. It's uh, Cuba. I think it goes called, called Cuba cloth. Anyway, I, I began to study those things, and, and I wanted to you know, share that, and I wanted to see if I could bring something so completely different. It, you know, the, the Chinese brush painting was so established in such a, a ready market. And I wanted to see what it would look like to take something completely different and bring it into pottery. And so this, this uh, piece on the right is kind of an African textile motif. And um, interestingly, I thought it was a fantastic piece and it took quite a long time to sell, but um, as I've done it, I've, as I've done more of them, they've become more popular. So it's it's an interesting um, dialogue that I have with my customers, where I might introduce something, and it may take a couple of cycles before I really can evaluate whether that is going to have some resonance and be something that I can continue with. I want to I want to say a little something about. Um, the vernacular pottery traditions of the Carolinas. Um, and this, these are both obviously jugs, um, similar to what you might have seen being made in the Carolinas in the 19th century um, for standard household use. Um, jugs and jars were the 
the plastic bottles and cardboard boxes of their day. And um, everybody needed to uh, have their cider, their molasses, their uh, whiskey, uh, whatever it was, they, they needed to preserve their food each year. Uh, they had milk rising crocks to um, butter churns, all of these things helped people survive in the era before refrigeration. And so there's a rich um, history that we sort of inherit from Europe and became Americanized. And I've studied, you know, um, aside from the Chinese brush painting, the, the other thing that has been most influential to me as a potter, an aspiring potter, is kind of 19th century Carolina ceramics. And um, this one on the left is an alkaline glaze. I've put a, meta a medallion on the center there, just a piece of clay with a little sprig indentation there. And uh, I laid a piece of stained glass over the top so that the glass would melt during the firing. And as you can see, it produces these beautiful runs down the side and it becomes an aesthetic component in the, in the pot. And this was something that I would see as I studied North Carolina pots. Um, there, there are examples where people would put glass on the handles and then if the, the, the potter, if the pot had dried too quickly, it might begin to, the handle might begin to come off during the firing. But if you had a piece of glass there, the glass would fuse it back to the piece of pottery, thereby saving that piece and making it a saleable um, piece of pottery. And of course, with the 20, 20th or 21st century eyes, we look at that and just see the, the decorative content of that. And um, so, so I love this sort of minimal, more minimal look as well. And this has been a part of, of what I do. But I also kind of like doing a mishmash where I take that same basic pot and then apply my sort of um, Chinese Soon Dynasty Chinese painting style. These are kind of peony patterns, and um, you know, just have them fuse. I've always I've always enjoyed a kind of a mashup. These are some large pots, um, and I'm going to show you in a minute here how these are built. Um, I imagine the one on the left was probably 36. 40 inches. The one on the right is a good bit smaller, but um, again, taking brushwork and learning how to fill up a large space and have it read simultaneously as one thing and yet having windows and little details, having your eye be drawn around carefully. And, and also, you know, I'm presenting this as a picture and pictures flatten things out. And if you were able to walk around this, you would have four different panels being seen. And we're gonna see as the Star Wars, as we look at the Star Wars pots, those pots have so much, or so dense with imagery. And, and if you only see it from one angle, you're really not getting the full story. So that's sort of one of the things that I really like about pottery is, is you can really, um, you can really go stream of consciousness and, and go all the way around a pot and um, really get sort of lost in your own little narratives. But so uh, more recently, I would say the pot on the right is probably within the last five years. And um, you can see there uh, the introduction of the pink, the brown is, is cut glaze back to the, uh, the brown color is back to a raw clay color. And you can see the, I don't know if you can see my arrow on the screen, but as I as I look at that round um, brown circle there, you can see the triangles. This is an eight pointed star common in Islamic art and common in sacred geometry in general. Um, and so along, uh, Along with African art history, I've always been drawn to sort of the dense, lush imagery or geometry of Islamic art. And um, I've begun to, to toy with that um, quite a bit and trying to figure out a way to incorporate 
um, geometry and new colors. Oops, I must have hit something. Let me see here. Geometry and new color colors with the older palette and the Chinese thing that I seem to have, you know, at, at a point you sort of create a monster and you have, uh, when, when, when you do something and do it well, people are drawn to it and they want to buy it. And you have to remember that, um, you know, you need to sell what people want to buy. There's, there's an economic narrative that's important not to lose sight of. And um, so I, uh, I always try to throw back some brush, brush painting or fuse brush painting with whatever it is I'm working with just because it works. It works, it, it fits in with everything I'm doing. It fills space that would look rather blank without it. And um, it's provided a, a fairly interesting continuity throughout my work. I'm gonna shift here for a moment to um, pottery that is more sort of self-consciously um, narrative in its subject. This is a this is a pot. This is Don Quixote. Um, and uh, again, just being interested in literature um, as a child and, and still today, I, I read uh, quite a lot. Um, and uh, I always liked the idea of this kind of fool in the character of Quixote who um, becomes so lovable. And, and what's interesting about this and how this all ties in is Quixote was a very boring man um, who was just lost in his books. His name was, uh, I believe his, he had a different name, uh, Quitano, Quijano, I can't remember what his name was. Anyway, um, he was a bookish man and loved to read stories of medieval chivalry. And he was really a little bit after the time of that, that that period had passed, but the literature was still popular. And so he would get lost in his literature and loved it, loved it. And one day he decided, and, and, and maybe this was some kind of um, psychological break that he had, <laughs> But uh, he decided that he himself was or could be a knight. And he basically created a, a narrative and stepped into it. And everything he saw, like this windmill, became uh, part of his narrative. So in his mind, this was, I, I can't remember, a, a dragon or something that needed to be slain for the good of all people. And he, he was the hero of his own story. And just metaphorically, I, found, I just find that idea very interesting. And, and I, I look at that and I see a little bit of that in myself of just like, you know, growing up thinking pottery had no significance, not even having ever heard of it. And then going to the point of like, oh, I'm actually, have actually stepped into the story, have become something, an artist, a potter, and just by sheer, power of belief in it, um, may, willed it to be true. And um, I hope I'm not quite as deluded as Quixote, but, <laughs> but still I find, um, I find uh, his, his narrative compelling. So I made this pot where I compared, uh, where I compared two figures from, well, one from literature and one from history um, we have Quixote, of course, on the right. On the left, we have Socrates. And this is actually um, just kind of a cartoonish drawing I did after uh, Jacques-Louis David, who is a French, uh, 19th century French painter, neoclassical painter. And he's done a, he did a painting of uh, Socrates drinking hemlock. And of course, the, the painting shows a whole group of, of Socrates followers begging him not to do it. And he's to turn, you know, he's going to drink the hemlock. And, um, you know, I, you know, I, I've always, I've always had the feeling that our society does not really value reason and um, intelligence as much as I would like it to. And here, here was an example from history, ancient history, 
where um, someone who was so compelling and, and interesting and logical was able to threaten a power structure to the point that it would put want him to be put to death. And um, anyway, I just thought it was an interesting juxtaposition to put Socrates executing reason, executing himself, and uh, Quixote on the back, and just, you know, obviously Socrates represented to me the folly of wisdom in a corrupt world that doesn't value it. And Quixote sort of, sort of represents the opposite of that, the, the wisdom of, of living out of folly, something that the world doesn't really care about, you know, tending your own garden, as, as Voltaire might say. So um, let's see. And I began to do a number of pieces every now and then where I would have, you know, on one side I would have an image and then I would, the other side would kind of take that image and twist it a little bit. So here I have, um, here I have a, a fellow fishing, catching a, a catfish. And um, well, I have a pond out at my house in Sandy Mush and I have a lot of people dropping in and fishing. And um, they always have like heavy metal t-shirts on. <laughs> and so I kind of threw that all together into this image and they always leave, you know, inevitably there's like some Mountain Dew bottle or something, some garbage left behind or whatever. But, you know, I love these people. <laughs> they're, you know, uh, the, the pejorative term would be redneck, but they're really good folks. They're just a little different than the way I was raised. And um, so, so anyway, I'm kind of paying homage to that person. And then on the back, I'm sort of, um, sort of enjoying an ironic um, reversal of fortune. Maybe, maybe someone for some reason was, you know, some, some kind of bluegrass uh, murder ballad, you know, where, where somebody's um, killed and thrown in the creek or thrown in the river or whatever and and a catfish has stripped the bones off there so you know whether whether the man eats the fish or the fish eats the man there's there's kind of a an equilibrium somewhere in the middle and anyway these kinds of things they engage my sense of humor as much as anything and um, I hope my sense of humor comes across in a lot of the things that I do um, because although I have some convictions and beliefs, I also just think part of, part of what makes anything worthwhile is whether it rhymes, whether it has any, uh, I don't even know how to, you know, wh whether there's, there's any fun in it, you know? Matt, um, first I yeah. can just say that yes, the humor definitely comes across, um, but we've had some questions come in, so I was wondering sure. if you wouldn't mind just answering some of those. So one came in from Kathy asking if you sketch your ideas before you shape your pots. I do not sketch the pots themselves. These Most of the pots are um, just ingrained ideas from my mind that I translate directly. I, I went through a period of time when I was learning that I would sketch and analyze shape very carefully and continue to go back to the books and look and look again and look at different regional variations of different pots. Um, in terms of decorative work, um, again, like I, I really didn't know how to draw when I, when I went to, <laughs> when I started my pottery apprenticeship. And I just, I literally sat next to somebody and watched him paint thousands of, of dragonflies and birds and fish. And then began to practice that on my own. And I learned how to use the brush before I ever learned how to use a drawing implement properly. And, and I think it was the brush that taught me the shapes and the feel, the, the, the um, just taught, taught me a visual sensibility. And then 
when I finally did pick up a pencil, I found that I was much better at analyzing um, the anatomical parts of animals or people or whatever, just from having that experience of working over and over, just basically drilling myself doing the 10,000 hours thing with something as simple as fish, birds, and dragonflies. But so then, um, what was there another question? Did I answer yes, that correctly? We actually, we have uh, two other questions. So the next one, and this probably depends on the size of the pot, the shape of the pot, but Laurel's asking on average, how long does it take to complete a piece? I love that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, my, my former mentor, Todd Piker, used to say, ask, get, get this question a lot, and he would say, and he would, he would answer it by asking another question, which was how long is a piece of string? And the idea is just, well, it takes as long as it takes. Um, but, but a better, that's kind of a smart ass answer. The, the better answer is it takes, you know, 10 years and 10 minutes, you know, it takes a lot of practice. And then in order to make a pot that is, uh, I'm looking at my screen now, these are probably 16 inch pots and they probably took 20 minutes a piece um, to, to just to turn them. And then there is, um, you have to tend to them, dry them carefully, keep them rotating, get the handles on. You have to do all the decorative work, which decorative work can be take a lot longer than it takes to make the pot. And then you have to get the glaze. Of course, you have to have the stack all the wood for the kiln. You have to clean all your kiln furniture. There's just a million steps. I mix all my own clay as well. So um, there's, there's just a whole lot more to that question than you might think. But, but the, the, the straightforward, easy answer is that takes about a half hour to, to actually throw the pot. And then the final, there's one final question. I do just want to let you know that it's just about 1.15 in case your clock's not up on your screen, just so you're oh, aware of time. Um, but if we go a little over, not a problem. Okay. If people okay. have to leave, we are recording so they can tune okay. in later. But I think, uh, you know, okay. time flies when you're having fun. So, I'm sorry. Um, no, don't be. This is great. Um, and so the final question is, uh, where did the folly of wisdom and the wisdom of folly end up? Is it on display somewhere? I sold it to somebody. I have no idea who has it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that happens, you know, some, some of the, my best work, you know, I, I'm lucky if I even get a picture of it. It just, you know, I make it because I enjoy making it. It comes out. I sell my work at, uh, at kiln openings twice a year at my, shop. You can um, go to jonespottery.com to find out a little bit more about it, to get on the mailing list. But basically, I have two big sales out in Sandy Mush each year, one in early June and one in early December. And that's about 90% of my business. So Great. if you're interested, um, I encourage you to, to um, get on our mailing list. I'll put that um, link in the chat box. I'm sorry? I'll put that link in the chat box. Okay, right. thank you. Um, so I, uh, I probably should just skip ahead um, and get into the Star Wars pots, um, but you can see here again, a sort of a sense of humor here. Um, I, I wanna emphasize that um, the natural world is, has always been one of my greatest sources of inspiration. And I hope that comes through not only in the blue brush painting stuff, but also in this um, white slip trail alkaline glaze um, tradition, which is kind of, those are kind of the two big, that's kind of the big divide within what I'm doing is whether it's painted or whether it's alkaline glaze with slip trailing. And, um, and yet, and, and, and then there's, uh, I sort of have also enjoyed some pop imagery and this is sort of leading towards the Star Wars thing, but you can see on the right here, this uh, Lone Ranger being assaulted by I, I think this is Pokemon, which is a Japanese anime uh, character. I, I, you know, <laughs> I just thought, yeah, you know, for some reason, I, actually it was my, I, I have a nephew who was really into Pokemon and I painted him, I painted the Pokemon image on a 
on a plate for him and gave it to him for his birthday. And so then I just had this Pokemon thing in my head and I had also done a Lone Ranger piece at one point. And I was like, what if those two were on the same pot and what kind of a dialogue would they have? And it just, it just, again, it just sort of tickled my funny bone, but there was also a little poignancy there because the Lone Ranger, he's, you know, he's kind of, he's kind of done. He's kind of gone. He's, he's my parents' generation. And the Pokemon is more like my nephew's generation or my children's generation. And I'm kind of in between them somewhere. And I don't relate at all to Pokemon. I can't, I don't even know what the hell he is, but there's a lot of problems with the, with the uh, Lone Ranger um, from sort of a political, <laughs> politically correct sort of understanding of, of what he represents. And, um, but to me, at least, there was an ethos there that made sense. And, and this uh, Pokemon character seems to be so postmodern. I, I really don't, I don't, there's, there's no morality. There's, I, I don't understand. I don't even know if there's a narrative structure that, that anchors Pokemon. He just seems to be this happy little critter. And it ha, I don't know, there's like a game and trading cards, but I don't really know if there's a real story. So I just thought it would be funny to put them together. Oh, yep, quickly, this is how the larger pots are constructed. There's a large uh, bowl, it's heated up, dr the water is driven off, then I roll out coils and attach them. And I sort of smooth them and work them in. And then um, if you just follow me down to the bottom left there, I use water and spin the wheel again and begin to throw the coils that I've attached and maybe I'll go up about six inches with each with each uh, set of coils and then I'll go back to the torch and um, the, you know that's just how it works you're going back and forth between adding clay using a torch and uh, refining the profile until you get your pot made so that's just kind of a quick note on how these pots are made. I, I, I trust that many of you have seen the Star Wars pots. They're probably, I, I don't know, 30, 36 inches tall in that neck of the woods anyway. And um, like I say, I mostly do a lot of pottery, you know, plates, bowls, that kind of stuff. But I also do this large range of work. A um, couple of shots of of decorative work going into the kiln there on the left with a large planter I think and there's an that's an apprentice with me I've had about nine apprentices over the last 20 years and there's on the right just stoking the firebox the kiln firing takes about 36 hours and I might have 500 pots in there so it's um, fun but slightly nerve-wracking time. All right, let's get to the Star Wars pots. Um, I'm so glad that that Pam took an interest in these. Um, I don't have a picture of the first one, um, but um, I, I remember making it and really liking it, and Pam came out and she liked it. And I think, uh, I wanna say Andrew Glasgow or Blue Spiral had exhibited my work and Andrew had talked it up to Pam and anyway she came out and saw the Star Star Wars pot and uh, bought it and got a lot of good feedback right away from I guess the buyer's circle or something like that and um, asked if I would consider you know making an, another one and then once <clears throat> once the second one was made being that it was Star Wars uh, it had to be a trilogy, so she commissioned a third one. And um, so I'm going to sort of walk you through the second and third one. And I apologize for running over long. Um, whoever wants to stay with us, you're welcome to do that. Um, I'm a little, I'm a little long-winded, and I'm not used to 
condensing everything very well. Anyway. You're doing great, Matt. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good. It's a little weird not really knowing who I'm talking to. Anyway, it's fun. So, uh, Star Wars uh, was the first movie I ever saw. I was, uh, I was born in 1971, and I believe the first Star Wars movie was 1977, so I must have been about six years old. And that movie hit me like the Bible, you know, it just, it was, it was magnificent and huge and it fascinated me. And um, it became, of course, this pop culture sensation. I, I believe the first movie may have even won the Academy Award that year, even though it's really not a great movie in a lot of ways, it has a lot of good architecture to the story. And um, I, I, I actually watched, uh, I think it was, a uh, what's his name? Bill Moyers did an interview with um, a famous uh, psychology teacher um, who was a st student of Carl Jung, I believe. Did, who am I thinking of? Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. If any of you know of Joseph Campbell, um, Joseph Campbell was deeply entrenched in mythological stories, and he actually helped write and um, work closely with George Lucas when George Lu Lucas was designing the movie Star Wars, the initial Star Wars movie, and they became lifelong friends, and um, a lot of the sort of mythical power of, of Star Wars relates to that relationship and um, a very self-conscious desire to have a story that had some sort of mythological uh, qualities. And I think that's why it became such a popular sensation is it's essentially, it's a, it's a, it's a story about um, a, a man who has who has become merged partly with a machine and as I watch Joseph Campbell talk about it, I'm, I'm speaking of Darth Vader. Darth Vader is the evil character who Luke Skywalker is the son of and he is trying to redeem his father over the course of the first three movies and um, Joseph Campbell says that Vader is um, represents uh, a man who has merged with the world of companies, the world of, of the, the corporate world. He's become, he, he's no longer fully human. And in a, in a way, he's kind of reminds me of, of Jesus Christ, but he's an inverted Jesus, you know, because Christ is fully human and fully God, and Vader is fully machine and fully man, or you know, some, some strange variation of, of, those, of those ideas. And, uh, and then Vader has joined in, uh, the, the side of evil. And essentially the story is about empire. And as I watched that and thought about that and thought about the history of empire, I thought about Rome and you, you always, I always wondered to myself, well, is Rome the good guys or are Rome, is Rome the bad guys? And, you know, when you're, look, when you're studying ancient history, you have to kind of consider that question because they are a civilizing force and a very important one at that. It's kind of the, the bedrock of our traditions in the West um, is inherited from Rome. But if you, if you were Celtic, in the Roman era, you might think that the Romans were, you know, horrible overlords who were trying to enslave you and take all of your wealth from you and destroy your culture. And so uh, as you look at the Star Wars story, of course, the, um, the empire, the evil empire is um, ruled by Vader and the, the emperor, I suppose. And they have a very naked and aggressive ambition of world dominance or interstellar dominance, I suppose. 
And so, you know, there's obviously a story, but the story doesn't interest me as much as what it might represent as I interpret it. And I look, of course, you have various empires that have, have risen and fallen throughout the course of human history. And, um, you know, so the, so the Roman Empire turns into the Holy Catholic Church. Um, many empires rise and fall. The, the Arabic or um, Islamic Empire rises and falls. The Mughals uh, uh, in India, Chinese empires rise and fall dynasties. Um, but in the West, eventually, um, eventually the British Empire becomes the first global empire. And of course, America ends up inheriting much of the imperial power that Britain used to wield. Um, after World War II, America and the Soviet Union are more or less the superpowers. And um, as communism collapsed in the 90s, we're sort of left with a single superpower being the United States. And I know we could argue about that, but let's not right now. Um, so as I look at the Star Wars narrative, I think about, um, and I was in, in this particular pot, I was thinking about uh, the Iraq war um, and the war on terror. And I titled this pot, you can see on the left, Absent Without Leave. And um, I actually took this stormtrooper from the reboot movie of the year I made it, I think, or maybe around there. And in that story, this stormtrooper was an orphan who, you know, was taken in and, and turned into a stormtrooper. And then he goes into combat and he realizes he has, a, he has an epiphany where they're basically gunning down innocent civilians. He has an epiphany and decides that he can no longer be a stormtrooper. And he, he, um, he kind of panics and has to leave. And um, and I felt, I felt myself narratively as I watched that thinking about how I felt about the world on the, the war on terror that had unfolded in the years prior to that. This was more or less as the war on terror was winding down. And I had a lot of unanswered questions and, and difficult feelings that I associated with, with the war on terror. And this, um, this question of empire and who are the good guys and who are the bad guys was with me a lot as I thought about those questions. Let me, and one of the things that bothered me, if you look at the image on the left, I don't know if you, if my drawing skill is, is good enough there, but that's, um, there was a prison in Iraq called Abu Ghraib. And um, there were a lot of people who were being sort of tortured there by um, Americans who didn't really have a lot of um, experience with it. There, were, there, was a, there was a big scandal that broke, most of you will remember, about these photographs that people were taking. You know, the digital camera had become a problem <laughs> for the US military. Um, they, this was like fraternity and sorority kids who were taking pictures of tor basically tormenting and torturing um, people who had been rounded up for possible terror links. And um, this picture, uh, there was a the man with a hood on his head and his hands spread out and attached to his hands were some kind of electrical components. And I don't think he was actually being shocked, but just um, psychologically tortured, but with his hands spread out, he, he sort of reminded me of a Christ-like, almost like a Christ-like sacrificial lamb or something. Anyway, the image just kind of stayed with me and I sort of put it right off to the side of the stormtrooper. And then um, if you look at the image on the right, I sort of felt, felt like I could identify strongly with that stormtrooper of just being, am I, how am I, you know, I don't really understand 
what we're doing. I don't know if I can support this. And if, if you look down to the left of this image, you'll see there's, um, there's a guy running after the stormtrooper, and that's metaphorically me at this point, because I'm questioning this whole war, war on terror narrative. And as I'm questioning it and talking it to people, people are acting like I'm crazy or that I just don't get it or something. And I feel like people, people, uh, you know, they're coming after me with a butterfly net. That was a, I'm, I'm sprinkling quotes from, from songs. That's I think from a Beck song, take a little trip, take a little trip with me there. The, uh, like that. Oh, this is there. I don't know, know if you can read that. And you may ask yourself, am I right or am I wrong? That comes from a talking head song. And, you know, um, just mixing a lot of different ideas together and in a stream of consciousness manner. So these, these butterflies, if we continue from the image before, the butterflies almost co-mingle with the airplane, which is about to crash into the World Trade Center. And one, there's a big smoke cloud emerging from World Trade Center there. And then right below that, I've got a, an image of, um, uh, of President Bush. Uh, and this is under the Mission Accomplished banner. And to me, I, I, I put that together because the mission that he seemed to accomplish was connecting this terrible attack on the World Trade Center with Iraq, which it didn't seem like those two things actually synced up very well. And yet that seemed to become the thrust of what we were doing. And all of a sudden it seemed like we were torturing people. And it, it was just very difficult and confusing. And if you look to the right, the media became such a big part of the story itself and media narratives in general today and forever, but more so than ever with the, with the internet and everything, we have just kaleidoscoping narratives constantly bombarding us at all times. And it becomes very difficult to know what you think anymore, or I find it difficult. And I have to limit myself to a, a rather moderate, immediate diet because it's too overwhelming. But I don't know, I, you know, I remember these anthrax scares at the beginning of the war on terror. And it's like the, the, there, were, there was never any follow up on that. And what was that all about? And, it, and it just like every day, something just more and more frightening than before. And, you know, all these code orange, code yellow, code red, and we can't fly anymore. And, oh, maybe there's yellow cake being sold, you know, you know, just everything. Oh, buy duct tape. You need to buy duct tape. We're going to be locking ourselves down and we're worried about chemical attacks. And it was just like, it was kind of crazy. It just seemed like we had I don't know what, exactly what it was. I don't know if it was just the media getting carried away with the stories and then knowing that everybody was so glued to it that it was just an opportunity. But fear it sells. I mean, it sells big. Um, and, uh, you know, there, uh, there's another little TV down at the bottom left that says WMD, WMD, WTF, WMD. You know, like, what the fuck is going on? Why, you know, the, there was a surplus of information and yet very little confirmed information. And it was deeply disorienting. And so, uh, and so the empire for me, you know, I, I, I used the little empire strikes back logo idea, but instead of the empire strikes back, I said the empire strikes Iraq and I believe to the right of that, uh, you'll have to look on the actual pot, but to the right of that, it, it says something about the empire having basically defined and described Iraq's geography. You know, the British empire drew the lines that created Iraq. 
Um, the United States supported Saddam Hussein in his rise to power, even though he was a Sunni and that was a majority Shia country. And the United States gave money to both Iran and Iraq to fight each other. And that would be kind of a bulwark, a, a, a wall to shelter um, Saudi Arabia, who of course was our close, our close ally, but um, you know, kind of confusingly, Saudi Arabia uh, is where 19 of the hijackers were from that, that were on the planes that hit, you know, I mean, I just, the whole thing was just so weird. There were so many aspects to it that disturbed me. And um, here at the top, I've got uh, shock and awe and audacity. And this um, off to the left, you can barely see, says something like this program is brought to you by GlaxoSmithKline, which is a pharmaceutical company. And to the right, I've drawn some pills, Paxil, I think, yeah. It says, ask your doctor if Paxil is right for you. It was the same time, all of this, uh, or maybe not the same time, but maybe 10 years after um, drugs were being advertised to us, like medical drugs were being advertised on the television set. And here they are advertising, you know, selling fear and then also selling you something that will help you deal with your fear. So we're going to create a bunch of anxiety and then we're going to sell you Paxil or Xanax or whatever you need to deal with your fear. It's just like the whole thing just kind of seemed very weird. And I, um, still seems it was, very it was, relevant, Matt. It was, yeah, but it was, it, yeah, for me, it was just a cathartic stream of consciousness protest of all of this. And, you know, there's, there's more to that than, than I have pictures of, but let's move on to the next one. <clears throat> so this is, um, so this is the third one in the trilogy. And I switched over to, <clears throat> excuse me, I switched over to the painted um, palette for this one. And um, I think it was, I think it worked really well. And um, I really wanted to have, I wanted to, to sort of scan back from the very specific conflict of the war on terror to something less specific and more just about um, empire in general or, or the battle of good versus evil. Um, and I guess the, the two main uh, proponents of, of the force, which is kind of this phony religion thing that pervades the whole Star Wars narrative. So you have um, Vader and the Empire trying to um, subdue the entire system, the entire universe. And so I've got Vader and a lot of, a lot of the things that are, that are written on this piece are from Vader's point of view. So up at the top here, you see it says, uh, peace is bought with submissive compliance. Uh, I think to the left there, it says inevitable certainty. I think that says um, empire is an inevitable mathematical certainty. And that seems to be true. Where Whenever there's a vacuum of power, it gets filled. And it usually gets filled with somebody who wants to control. And, you know, right now you, you could say perhaps the United States is, is in that seat, in the driver's seat, and has been for 50 years or 75 years. Um, but it's not clear that we know where we're going, but um, what's important 
or what seems to be important is that our economy is doing well. And then on the other hand, you have this um, Buddha-like, Christ-like um, figure of transcendence, which is horribly played by Frank Oz, the, the Muppet guy. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, I shouldn't even say horribly. It, he's a, it's a beautiful character, but it, there's things about the character that I just, even as a child, I was cringing to listen to his voice. <laughs> But anyway, Yoda <clears throat> presents a, a, a very important counterpoint, a spiritual counterpoint to the materialism and dominance of the empire. And so I've created him <clears throat> as kind of the center piece or almost a flower. And beneath it, if you look on the left, that's on the left is the same image before it was fired. So you can see the way the um, paint, for lack of a better word, the oxides change color as they're heated from one to the other. But uh, Yoda is a symbol of love, freedom, transcendence, dignity, wisdom, discipline, and humility. And, and if you think about that, that's, that's kind of a Christ ideal, that's kind of a um, Buddha I ideal. And um, it's important to have a counter narrative when there's a, a dominant narrative that, that seems so, as, as in the Star Wars so, story, so unrelenting, so forceful. And so at the top, if you go to the left here at the top, you'll see love is an illusion. And that's the Vader point of view. Or if you go to the, whoops, if you go <clears throat> down beneath Yoda, it says more morality is a useful construct, but there is only power and weakness. And what's interesting to me is that the empire is really missing so much of what makes life worth living by focusing only on material dominance. And I, I think that this goes back to uh, having grown up in a religious um, family and then learning through time to just respect and be more empathetic. Um, I, I, I'm actually not particularly religious anymore. I'm not at all religious anymore, but I, I, I think a lot of the spiritual uh, information that I received <clears throat> as a child still is still with me. Um, let me just go, did I miss one? Oh, here we are. Too much is never enough. We only want everything. So, and, and you, here you have Vader, but if you notice down beneath Vader, there's an icon of a heart inside a cage there. And Vader really has no idea that he has been destroyed by his own crass desire for power and revenge and hatred. Uh, collateral damage. We always hear about collateral damage. And then there, there's the ultimate super weapon, the Death Star. If you look at the right side of your screen, capable of blowing up entire planets. That's obviously been relevant since the end of World War II. And then I had areas that needed to be filled in. And I have here an image of uh, R2-D2, another droid. And he's, um, I guess this is from the first movie, he's projecting an image of, of Princess Leia, and she's saying, they're evil. <laughs> and uh, above that, <clears throat> there will be blood. I think that was a movie that year about, uh, that was a Daniel Day-Lewis movie that year, and very much about 
um, the oil industry, I think, in Texas. He was an oil prospector. And um, when there's something of value to be harvested, people will fight. A, they, when our, there's a resource that's that valuable, it'll eventually be fought over. There's an inevitability there. Again, empire is an inevitable thing. And then if you look to the right side of your screen there, this is something I, oopsie, always do that. The right side of your screen there, I threw something completely different into this pot. And really on all three pots, there's some little corner of the pot somewhere that has just like, let's change the angle a little bit. And this is, um, this is the People's Front of Judea, which doesn't come out of the Star Wars narrative at all. It comes out of a Monty Python skit, <laughs> a Monty Python sketch from The Life of Brian, which is uh, a wonderful, wonderful comedy, comedy um, spoofing human beings um, tr who are mistaking a very ordinary person named Brian with the Messiah. <laughs> and uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a great movie. It's hilarious in many ways, but one of the wonderful things I, I love so much in that movie is um, you have these super, super political people called the People's Front of Judea, and they're always fighting with one another about who's the most radical and who's, you know, who's got the craziest ideology and who's, uh, they're always saying, you know, what have the Romans done for us? You know, the Romans are just oppressors. And there's a wonderful scene where um, John Cleese says, what have the Romans ever done for us? And, and everybody's quiet and it's just, you could hear a pin drop. And then somebody says, well, well, they built the roads. And, and, and he says, right, right they did build the roads and somebody else says, and the aqueducts and, and it goes on and on and on. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, besides the roads, the aqueducts, the public sanitation, the education, law and order, Pax Romana, et cetera. It's just like all of these things that have come with the sort of corrupt power of empire. Um, and still these people are angry. And so I have to ask myself, and this is a way of turning the narrative back on myself and saying, okay, it's, it's useful and interesting to think about America as an imperial power. And sometimes I question whether we're on the right side of history or not. But as I say, if, if, we're, not, if we're not gonna be the power, somebody else is gonna be the power. And there does seem to be something good about having a power that stabilizes um, the world. You know, in, in the case of Rome, obviously they brought civilization and peace to a large number of people once they were conquered. And, um, you know, can we redeem ourselves as Americans after conquering the peoples of the world if we bring them peace and prosperity? So that's an open-ended question and I don't have the answer, but um, I had to throw that in there just as a little, I don't know, shout out to myself. All right, I know we're, uh, I know we're way past time. I have more stuff, but I could also just call it right here. It's up I, to you guys. I think we might have to. It sounds like some of my colleagues are waiting on our Zoom account. So um, very good. This has been fantastic, Matt. I wish we could keep going for a long time. I'm dying to know what you you've been up to, and I was writing down all of the the things you mentioned that have influenced you from African art, Islamic art, natural world, 19th century Carolina ceramic. China porcelain and brush painting, songs, literature. It's just amazing. And I can only imagine what creative works you're coming up with. And um, I hope everyone does visit your website, sign up for your emails, um, and hopefully be there at your next kiln opening. Um, but thank you so much for leading today's program. This has been wonderful. Um, 
I'm a pleasure. more thank enamored you. with those pots. So um, it's great. And thank you. And thanks to our collector circle for making the purchase of many of those possible. So, um, and thank you to our members who joined us today. It looks like a few have signed off, um, but I'm sure they'll catch the recording when it's posted. Um, and our next member program will be on the 27th. Um, it'll be led by my colleague, Christy McMillan. I hope you guys will be able to join us for that too. Um, and I'll send out an evaluation in just a few minutes. I hope you all stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you again, Matt. Thank you.